Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is January 9th, 2021, and this is the weekly market update. So wanted to talk about President-elect, our future president, Joe Biden, came out with his proposed spending plan that he's going to try to get going in the first, uh, first act of his administration. Um, this was seconded by Chuck Schumer, who said that he wanted to, first thing he wanted to work on was a $2,000 stimulus uh, check for each person. Um, so let's just go through this real quick. Uh, this is from an article. I'll link all these articles to the show notes. Joe Biden is considering asking Congress to help suffering Americans in two steps. Give them the balance of their coveted $2,000 coronavirus payments, followed by a $3 trillion tax and infrastructure package. The first bite would come in the form of $1,400 payments that would be added to the $600 in cash Congress approved last month. Also included in this quick hit package would be money for state and local aid, as well as funding for vaccine distribution. Biden's initial plan was for a bill under one trillion, but he said on Friday that, quote, economic research confirms with conditions like the crisis today, especially with such low interest rates, taking immediate action, even with deficit financing, is going to help the economy, unquote. I just added this in there that wasn't in the article. U.S. Treasury bonds climbed to their highest levels since March of last year. So I'm not going to get into the merits of deficit spending. I'm not going to talk about the debt anymore. The debt is out of control. The spending's out of control. Um, the merits of whether or not more money should be spent to people. What they should do is open the economy up. I've said this before. We should protect the most vulnerable people in our population, and everybody else should go back to work. If you're sick, don't go to work. And uh, we should continue vaccinating if that's what people want to take the vaccination or let the virus um, do do what viruses do, which is they virus, and they, and then uh, we'll get through it. But uh, they're not going to do that, so we're going to spend three trillion dollars. Now, what's interesting in here is, you know, elections do have consequences. That's one thing that uh, President Obama said, and he was correct. You have uh, many mismanaged states, uh, which we've talked about before: California, Illinois, New York, Connecticut. You just go down the list. And this is what you're talking about here. Money for state and local aid. Um, city of Chicago, city of New York, all these mismanaged municipalities. This is what this is. It's going to be a bailout for them. Uh, this is what happened in 2008 after the crisis then. We had a bailout. Uh, if you remember, you know, I guess it depends on your political persuasion. You uh, might think this is good. You might think this is bad. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. What matters is they don't have the money. It's deficit spending, and it's going to be inflationary. If you are not paying attention, um, we've got WTI now over 50. We've got Brent closing in on 55. We have the CRB index of commodities in a 45 degree angle to the upturn. We've got, um, I've got wheat, corn, and soybeans making near all time highs, near term all time highs. Not all time, but recent highs. Um, I have multiple of commodities. I have commodity stocks breaking out all over. I could sit here for two hours and go through all the charts. I've got copper up at 370 a pound. I've got nickel over $8 a pound. I could go on and on. Um, and now we're going to throw more fuel on the fire. So I'll get into more of this because I think it's important. This is the narrative that we were talking about. This is what we thought would happen. And it didn't really matter if it was President Trump or Biden getting elected, they want to spend money. This is what they want to do. They've always wanted to do it. And now, you know, it's setting up perfectly, just like we kind of predicted, you know, um, this shows no sense of economic history or knowledge. This quote here, economic research confirms what economic research cite specifically what economic research confirms that with conditions like today, with, with such low interest rates, taking immediate action, even with deficit financing, is going to help the economy. Yeah, you can get a short-term sugar high. If I throw $3 trillion into a 
22 trillion dollar economy yeah you're going to get some economic uh benefit you're going to get some economic growth you're going to get some you're going to get a sugar high what you're going to get though you know you're not having any long-term infrastructure spending you know they use the word infrastructure you're not going to get any infrastructure spending you're going to get bailout of democratic constituencies and two thousand dollars to people that's all you're going to get they're going to go out and spend it they're going to be right back where they started but you're going to be left with more debt and now you have rates going up now this is going to take time to play out but the inflationary catalysts is are already mixing you know it's like an exothermic reaction you mix a certain constituents and they create a reaction that gives off heat and that's what we that's what we're seeing here it's all coming together perfectly as we thought it would been talking about this for months and now you know we got the perfect storm hitting so you can get mad about it all you want but you know i've been positioned in, i mean the portfolio is exploding higher i i don't want to say that's because i'm such a genius it's being in the right place at the right time it's a matter of understanding politics understanding human nature understanding history that's what we've been talking about on this channel for six months or a year what we thought was going to happen. It's happening now. You know, this is another example, right? Be careful what you wish for because you just might get it is the same. Chicago Federal Reserve, this is a Reuters article. This isn't fringe stuff off Alex Jones. This is a Reuters article. Chicago Federal Reserve President Charles Evans on Tuesday, re, this is last Tuesday, reiterated his view the U.S. Central Bank ought to aggressively woo higher inflation after years of underrunning its 2% target. Quote, frankly, if we got 3% inflation, that would not be so bad, unquote, as long as it is not accelerating uncontrollably. Goes on to say in the article, with structurally low interest rates pulling down on inflation, however, Quote, it is very difficult to imagine out of control inflation, even with the large debt that physical authorities have been running up. You know, I was listening to a podcast this week, and a lot of you young guys or young people that are listening to this, I know the demographics, I can see it on YouTube. You don't know what it was like in the late 70s, 78, 79, and 80, when the United States had double digit inflation when Paul Volcker had to come in as the, I remember living during that time. I remember what it was like. Now I was just a kid. You know, I was only 10, 12 years old. I had a very inkling of what was going on, but I, I was just beginning my journey in financial stuff. I would watch different things. I didn't have an understanding what was going on, but I do remember what was happening. So I do have that perspective. And I remember the sediment was out there when we had high inflation, it was endemic. We had stagflation, the economy wasn't growing, unemployment, you know, it was just not a good, you know, my parents were both working in industries. One was a municipal worker, the other one was a nurse. I mean, so they had, you know, jobs that weren't gonna go away, but there were, I do remember as a kid, when I grew up in South Florida, many, many cousins, uncles leaving New York State, coming down to Florida because it was supposed to be the new promised land, you know, because all the industries were being devastated. You know, the steel industry had collapsed, manufacturing had collapsed. And these cities were turning, you know, you just couldn't get anywhere. So it was like, instead of go west, young man, it was go to Florida, you know, sunshine and uh, unlimited opportunities. But getting back to the narrative on this podcast, and I remember this now, as being true, when the inflation was going, when the rates were high, people didn't think it was going to end. They thought, man, when is this going to end? How will it end? This is terrible, blah, blah, blah. And so we're seeing the reverse of this thing. This is human nature. Again, guys, here we have a Federal Reserve chair uh, president of the Chicago Fed. It's not some rinky dink uh, deal here. And he's saying, you know, it's very difficult to imagine out of control inflation, even with the large debt that physical authorities have been running up. Why is it, so, so we have these, so we have the, the president-elect saying we have low rates. So we're just gonna have low rates forever, no matter what we do. We can just beat the crap out of the uh, deficit. We can just print money, we can deficit spend because we got low rates and we've always had low rates, right? Cause that's called recency bias, guys. It's another bias. Now these are politicians, so they lie anyways. They're gonna lie and do whatever is expedient to keep the game going so they get reelected. That's what this is all about. 
Now, let me tell you something. You are going to have economic growth when they do this stuff. Believe me, you're also going to have inflation. Now, what happens six months, a year, 18 months from now, that's the real question. Rates are already starting to move up. You've already had the 10-year at the highest level since last March. You know, and then at some point, you know, that's going to react. Uh, rates are going to react to this, this kind of, um, shall we say, fiscal malfeasance is what I called it in the past. And so I don't know how far we'll get out of control. I don't know. But the problem with this inflation and stuff like that is, well, you don't have it now, but if you get it going, will you be able to put the genie back in the bottle? That's the question. And, you know, you talk to the MMTers and they say, well, you know, we can do these things as long as we don't have inflation. And if we get inflation, it's just a matter then of using taxation to pull money out of the economy. I mean, it's just stupid. It just shows a, a childlike understanding or uh, being naive towards how this things. You know how hard it is to raise and lower taxes in this country, the political fight that you're going to have? Well, you know, you're just going to be able to do it like churning a knob on a boiler. Well, it's a little bit cooler in here, so I need to, you know, turn up the thermostat. Or it's too hot, I just turn the thermostat down. It, that's not how things work in a legislative body, even with marginal uh, Democratic majorities. So there's no big mandate here. Now, I think they're going to go ahead with the spending, but, you know, We've crossed that Rubicon. I, you know, one of my best performing videos was meet your new meet the first MMT president, Donald Trump. And he was. I mean, he had all these tax cuts. He spent all this money and he wasn't going to pay for it because he knows that the debt's never going to be paid back. And now we're, we've got into full MMT. We have a compliant Fed. We have had an exercise in violating laws by creating special purpose vehicles, buying outright bonds, buying stocks, whatever they were doing. We have Janet Yellen now at the Treasury, who's already said that she wants to use the Treasury and the government as a means to rectify social injustice and deal with the climate. I mean, so you're just opening this up. This is not me telling you that it's wrong. This is not being a libertarian or saying, you know, from a political perspective, I just, I'm just telling you what's going to happen. What I think is going to happen as a result of these policies and why you're seeing a lot of these underperforming commodity type sectors are exploding upwards and breaking out out of long-term, you know, basis. That's what's been happening over the last month. The actionable intelligence alert newsletter portfolio is crushing the S&P 500. I mean, we're breaking out all over the place. Doesn't mean, it doesn't, because I'm some genius, it's just inevitable. As a rotation comes into a reflation trade, that's what we're seeing. And, you know, we're seeing this starting to line up now. Everybody's lined up. There's no one standing in the way of this stuff. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's good for our position. This is uh, Otavio Costa. He's one of the guys over at Crescat Capital. I don't know. I like them. I follow them. Um, if you go to my uh, investment letter curation site that I have, they're one of the uh, people that I follow over there. They have some excellent, uh, good thoughts about these things we're talking about. This was a tweet that he put out this week. I just wanted to put it up here because it kind of catches the sediment. I want to, I want to, the flavor of the sediment that I'm trying to capture here. Um, and he was talking about, um, I just put up here, sell gold, no way. And, okay, all right, let's, let's list the reasons why you wouldn't. You know, I mean, you got a democratic sweep, you got the return of Yellen, who's a dove. IMF calling for a great reset, more spending, uh, green, you know, spending. Fed saying, quote, not even thinking about raising rates. Unlimited QE on an auto play. It's $120 billion a month they're, they're buying. And twin deficits getting worse. No way this is stopping at $27 trillion of public debt. That's exactly right. But, you know, you would notice this week that gold got clobbered. There was a couple of big down days where gold got clobbered. You think with all this news, why isn't gold going up, John? You know, gold, this is all the news that you would want to see for gold to go up. But you got to remember something. Real rates are what are what push gold up and down. What happened to real rates this week? The tenure was rallying based on all this news, all this spending they're talking about doing. 
the 10 year rates are going up. So real interest rates, uh, they're still negative, but they're, they're, you know, they, they're started turning around, right? They started getting less negative and that's not good for gold. These things are going to ebb and flow. Believe me, if they get the, if they do what they're saying, they're going to get a tremendous amount of inflation. If rates get too high, remember, we've talked about this before, rates aren't going to be going back to some normalized area of four and a half or 5%. They can't because the whole debt fueled uh, economy would implode into a deflationary depression. That's not going to be happening. So at some point, I think they're going to get into a situation if they want to continue spending this money, if they want to continue having this inflation that they want. We've talked about this before. This is what's going to happen longer term. Yield, um, yield control, where they, where they keep yields locked down, but inflation will be allowed to move higher. We've talked about that before. Yield, yield curve control is what they call it. But that's not going to happen right this second. But you're already starting to see, you know, Markets do work. They respond. People are like, wait a minute. The bond market's like, wait a minute. Um, if you're going to do what you're saying you're doing, then go, then then bonds are going to rally on that. So there are intermarket relationships that you need to understand. And you can you can have these, you know, short-term uh, vacillations in the market of these intermarket relationships. But in the long term, these type of things are going to lead to higher inflation and, and rates won't be allowed. The, the return of the bond vigilantes will be aborted, believe me. It won't fit the narrative. So we've had this discussion many, many times. Uh, there's a couple guys in the, we start talking about inflation and price rises. You know, I define, define inflation uh, the way Milt Friedman did, where inflation is is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Inflation, I define it, and he defined it as an increase in the, in money supplied. And uh, the result of that could be, and in many cases, is goods and service inflation of the price. You know, price rises. I don't like using the word inflation just to say, well, the price of a Milky Way bar went up that gives people the wrong impression. Um, when you create more money, which you can create money faster than you can create the supply of goods, typically the price of goods can go up. But this is very sticky, right? We've seen it in asset prices. We haven't seen a way to um, transfer the price or transfer the money creation directly into the real economy. That's where some of, we've talked about this many times in the past. And I'll get into this more in some subsequent videos. You're talking about the Cantillon effect and who gets the money first and that kind of stuff. But I don't have time in this video. So this Chapwood Index, somebody turned me on. It was actually Dave Collum, who's the chemist at Cornell University that does that great um, yearly review, which I recommend everybody reads. But I'm going to put a link to this site. I would check this out because the contention is these are some money managers. And they said, you know what? CPI is broken. I've said that for a long time. The, the government is incentivized not to measure CPI correctly. Why? Because many entitlement programs, social security, veterans uh, pensions, employee pensions, all these things that are costing hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, they have cost of living escalators built in that are tied to the CPI. Therefore, it's not, the government is not incentivized. They are not incentivized to properly measure CPI just because of that. Plus, it would call into question if you had real, they've, they have messed around with this a couple times. We'll go into it. This is off the, the website. But what I wanted to point out here is Chapwood Index looks at, you can go there and do your own research. Basically, it's, it's, it's looking at a, they do their own calculation based on, you can go check it out, how they do it. And it makes a lot of sense. Basically, the end result is a list about the top 50 uh, cities in the U.S. And you're looking at uh, price rises over the last five years, averaging per year from the high single digits to low double digits, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent a year. That makes sense to me. You know, you've seen the inflation. People say, well, there's no inflation. Well, what do you mean there's no inflation? Candy bars keep shrinking. I, I use the example of this guy came in, he was selling um, world's greatest chocolate. I remember when I was in eighth and ninth grade, they'd get you to send, sell this chocolate at school and the bars were pretty big, man. I mean, for like a buck, I think they sold them for a buck back then. They were huge, right? The, the kid pulled it out and I'm like, 
this thing's like one third the size or one quarter the size it wasn't that when I was selling it 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and the thing costs like three times as much. That's an example of how this works. You know, a comic book used to cost me 25 cents when I was growing up. I think they're four bucks now I saw, or, you know, stuff like that. So I like what they say. This is off their site. You can go check it out. I encourage you to check it out. It's interesting. Look how they calculate their index. If it's true, then things are understated and they're understated for a reason. You know, incentives matter. As Charlie Munger says, show me the incentive and I will tell you the outcome. I think the government's with all the billions of dollars that it has to pay out every year to social security recipients and people on pensions and all that stuff that they're incentivized to have a true and correct cost of living adjustment every year that would that compounds on itself i don't think so what do they say at the chapwood index site i am tired of observing people commit financial suicide i firmly believe the government gravely underestimates the national rate of inflation a number also plagued with bias and statistical manipulation couldn't say it better than myself. This is true. It is universally assumed that the government's rate of inflation is accurate. It simply isn't. Americans that rely on this statistic are falling behind financially. Of course, that's what we've been saying more and more every year. Individual purchasing power is sinking in quicksand, and people are un unable to maintain, maintain their current lifestyle. It's exactly why you have this populist uprising. In 1983, the government CPI rose roughly 12%. And the government modified the CPI calculation to save money. In order to save money on salary increases and entitlement benefits, which are tied to CPI, the government changed their calculation of the CPI to reflect a much lower number. The statistic underwent another reconfiguration in 95 and 96 with the Boskin Commission. These changes made the CPI even an even worse indication of the real cost of living. I agree with this 100%. I went on the site, I played with it, I looked at how they calculate it. Uh, it may be confirmation bias. You know, <clears throat> this is another one of these things when you start talking about it, where people get really uh, either one way or the other. Oh, you're all wet, John. Um, you know, I don't believe the government. Why would all of a sudden I'm believing the government on CPI? Uh, really? I mean, you know, if you want to believe them, you believe them. I don't. Okay. Wanted to talk about this. This is interesting. This is the Fidelity Contra Fund. Okay. It's under the Fi Fidelity family of funds. Uh, look over here. Um, they have $136 billion under management. Now, Contra, you'd think to yourself, does that mean contrarian? I don't know. Um, they do describe the strategy of the fund as being investing in securities whose value the fund manager believes is not fully recognized by the public. Investing in either growth stocks or value stocks or both. Normally investing primarily in common stocks. Okay. Uh, I didn't show what the top holdings were, but there was stuff like Amazon. It's all the high flyers, okay? That's, that's what the fund manager believes is not fully recognized by the public. Are you for, are you for real? The point I want to make, though, besides criticizing the fund manager, who's evidently been there for 30 years, is that, look down here, energy is only 0.34% of the fund. Now, this is a contra fund, right? Of supposed to be you know, stocks that the fund manager thinks are undervalued. Um, the point I'm trying to make is, is that I have oil breaking out, energy is breaking out, and funds are not positioned for this. We're already seeing stocks move higher. Um, as energy out, start, begins to outperform these other sectors, they are going to have to move into those sectors or they will underperform the metrics, Okay. Um, the other thing you're going to see, what we've seen before, is as inflation increases and bonds and, and interest rates begin to creep up, it's really it's going to socket to things like uh, these growth stocks. They do not like a interest, rising interest rate environment, typically. So I wanted to point that out. I also, like I said, I wanted to point out that, you know, 
most people now are underinvested in energy stocks and in oil stocks in particular. And if you want to get even drilled down even further to the most beat up stocks, Canadian energy stocks, which have really been going nuts. And I've been, you know, knee deep in. And to show that, here is uh, a slide that uh, our friend Eric Nuttall uh, at Nine Point Partners up in Canada, he's, a, he's one of the last energy fund managers in Canada, but he typically does this slide. It's, uh, you know, um, this is for illustrative purposes, obviously. These are their assumptions, but uh, he's put these charts out in the past. These were pretty close. 2021 free cash flow yields at $60 WTI with a $10 West, Western Canadian sediment differential. They have a differential in crude prices in Canada just because of the transportation and stuff like that. So that's something that is tracked as the differentials. But anyways, long story short, you know, here are the free cash flow yields. Uh, and what's free cash flow, right? They're defining as operating cash flow minus CapEx required to keep production flat. So, and they say that this is um, minus or pre-hedging. It's trying to give you what, what, what point I'm trying to make here is these companies have leaned down so much that even at $50, $60 WTI, the cash flow yields are tremendous. You take a company like BTE here, right? I think it's Baytex at a 65% cash flow yield. Um, they just have maintenance capital going on. That means no more drilling and they have a 65% cash flow yield. So you're just blowing down the production. You could take the cash flow and conceivably in a year and a half buy the, you couldn't really do it in real life. I'm just saying for illustrative purposes, you could conceivably buy all the outstanding stock and take the company private. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that, um, you know, I talked about last week, my view that I thought oil could go to $65 a barrel in 2021 or even higher. And uh, there was an excellent, um, excellent interview of Art Berman on Macro Voices this week, and they talked about comparative inventory and these things. And uh, people are not really paying attention, uh, as you can see, even by the Contra Fund being underinvested. You know, uh, showed the Contra Fund only having um, point three point a, th a third of one percent of their uh, assets in energy and energy represents about two and a half percent of the s p so extremely under invested in this sector a sector that is breaking out a sector that uh, if these prices hold which i believe they will you know with the vaccinations happening all this money being thrown a recovery that's going to happen that everybody's predicting you're going to have increased energy consumption people are going to become begin traveling again you know, if oil gets 60, 65, $70 a barrel, these things are going to be tremendously cash flowing. What would that cash be used for? Buying back stock, dividend payments, paying down debt, which are all accretive to shareholders. And like I said, if you want to do something this weekend, go on stock charts and just look at the charts of these different oil companies and they're all breaking up, breaking higher. You have 50 day moving averages doing crosses going moving above the 200 day moving averages. This is all very bullish. You're seeing a sea change. You're seeing things now moving from bearish to bullish. It's an inflection point is my point. So haven't talked about offshore oil in a while. Um, this was a slide off the Basso 2020 rig roundup on their website. Uh, it's free. I read them. I signed up for their emails. They send you emails about the state of the offshore drilling industry. This is one of the slides, you know, somebody brought this up uh, after I talked to Trader Ferg and, you know, what's really going on. And, you know, here we have, you know, last year, five major players began chapter 11 bankruptcy proceedings. As you can see, um, you have uh, Pacific Drilling, Diamond Offshore, Noble, Valeris, and Sea Drill. And uh, Noble and Pacific Drilling have cleared and exited bankruptcy. So those are the ones on the right that you'd want to keep an eye on right now. I'm not suggesting you buy them, but I'm saying they have exited. The industry has not recovered yet. Uh, we want to see more rigs get scrapped. As these co companies go through bankruptcy, that will be the opportunity to rationalize their rigs, get rid of a lot of the older rigs that they were keeping on the balance sheet because uh, they don't want to take write downs. Now that you're in bankruptcy, 
this is the time to take the write downs. What I find interesting, and I pointed out on Twitter this week, was that scrap steel prices are like at recent record highs also. So this is the time to start sending things to the ship breakers. We're going to get the maximum value for those uh, assets that you need to scrap. But uh, you can see this is, the, this is what we wanted to see, the preliminary beginnings of a rationalization and reorganization of the offshore drilling industry. More to come on this as we move through 2021. And that is it for this week. Having trouble controlling this, guys. Um, like I said, lots of things happening. Um, it's very exciting what's happening. Uh, we're following it in the actionable intelligence uh, alert newsletter. I mean, I'm really excited about what the portfolios performed over the last two quarters. We're starting out really strong in 2021. I was just amazed at some of the moves that I saw in some of the companies that I'm following last week. I mean, it was it was breathtaking. I mean, we've got Bitcoin, I think, cracked 40,000. I mean, we have a full on crack up boom happening here now, folks. And tremendous amount of wealth is going to be transferred from from the stoops to people that know what's going on. So I encourage you to, uh, you know, take a subscription because things are finally starting to turn our way. I'm not saying I'm some great portfolio manager. Uh, you know, you got to wait and you got to wait and you got to wait. And then these things, we thought this was what would, what, what would eventually happen. Now it has been accelerated. I didn't think it was going to happen this quick, but things are starting to accelerate to our side of the, um, of the tennis court, if you will, We're, things are moving our way. So encourage you to uh, look into taking a subscription, appreciate the follows, appreciate the support. And I had a lot more to talk about this week, but it's just so much stuff going on. You can only fit so much into these videos. So appreciate the viewership, appreciate the support, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks guys.